Parishioners and guests are always impressed by the art-filled walls and ceilings when they come into Utica, New York's St. Mary Mount Carmel Blessed Sacrament Church. Perhaps the most looked at and admired work lies in the apse over our main altar. This impressive work is a copy of the upper portion of one of the masterpieces of the great Renaissance painter Raffaello Sanzio, known as Raphael in English. And like most great works of art, it has an interesting backstory. Raffaello was born in 1483 in the Italian town of Urbino, one of the great centers of culture of Renaissance Italy. Its court at the Ducal Palace was a magnet for artists, philosophers, and other great persons of that time. Raffaello's father, Giovanni de Santi, was an artist by trade who worked at the palace and churches in the area. He trained his son until he recognized that the boy's talent for far outstripped his own. Giovanni traveled to Umbria and convinced Pietro Venucci, known as Il Perugino, as it was in Perugia where he did most of his work and where he had his studio. Perugino's ethereal works were so renowned that he was called to Rome and contributed some of the panel frescoes that now lie below the divine Michelangelo's world-famous ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Perugino was impressed by the talents of his new apprentice. It was not long before Raffaello was able to copy his master's style so thoroughly that Giorgio Vasari, a contemporary and father of art history, said one could barely discern the differences between the contributions of the two. In a short time, the boy was completing commissions of his own. In 1504, Raffaello had the opportunity to go to Florence and observe and study the works of other great masters. He was able to see the proposed works of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo for the decoration of the Palazzo Vecchio, the city's town hall. The young artist was a sponge and soaked up all the inspiration he could muster and this began to alter his own style, making his work unique among all the artists of his time. His use of color and sfumatura, the knack of mixing and blending pigments to mimic the real life type tones of his subjects amazed his patrons, friends, and critics. In 1508, the young master received an invitation to the papal court upon the recommendation of the great architect Bramante. Bramante was also from the area of Urbino and had become the principal architect of the new St. Peter's Basilica. It is his plan that the Michelangelo would later modify and bring closer to completion. Pope Julius II commissioned Raffaello to decorate a suite of rooms in the Papal Palace. The first, the Stanza della Segnatura was for the tribunal of the Segnatura Gratia Lustitiae, the highest court of the Holy See. It is where decisions that would be carried out within the Church and those in the secular realm of the Pope's dominion would originate. These themes were carried out in the frescoes that Raffaello produced. The first work we will examine is the School of Athens. The scene is laid in a classical building reminiscent of the great Roman basilicas. The lines of perspective converge in the center of the scene, where the great theologians reconcile philosophy and astrology with theology. By grounding the characters in this earthly, if a bit over the top landscape, it shows man trying to understand truth within the limits of his intellect. Some of the characters bear the faces of the greatest minds and respected contemporaries of the artist. In the center, Plato bears the face of Leonardo. He holds a book in his left hand while his right points heavenward, indicating that the real world is not the physical one, rather the spiritual world is, where from which all ideas arrive. Aristotle, to the right of Plato, gestures towards the viewer as if to say, real experience, empiricism is the basis of human knowledge. In the foreground, Heraclitus, a solitary figure writing while leaning on a block of marble, bears the face of Michelangelo. 
And in this figure, the artist pays the ultimate compliment to the great maestro by copying the style of his figures on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Euclid, the father of geometry, is a figure on the right, bent down and scribing with a compass on a tablet, and is portrayed by Bramante. And on the extreme right side of the fresco, the artist leaves his signature in the modest self-portrait wearing a black cap at the base of the arch. In truth, this signature was a leap, as painters of that day, particularly on commissions for the church, rarely signed their work. The Pope was so pleased with the fresco that upon seeing it, he had all the other works in the suite of rooms destroyed so that Raffaello could redecorate them all. It is now that we will turn to the fresco in the same room that faces this work and is the inspiration for the one found over the main altar of St. Mary of Mount Carmel, Blessed Sacrament Church. As a counterpoint to the School of Athens, the disputation of the Holy Sacrament, probably the first fresco the 27-year-old Raffaello painted at the Vatican, focuses on faith over human reason. It was created prior to the previous work, but we thought it necessary to explore the human side before touching on the divine. Here, rather than a confined man-made space, the characters themselves create the architecture of the fresco emphasizing that the church is made of its people. The original work in Rome also has two levels. The work in Mount Carmel Church concentrates on the upper level. Taken in its whole, the composition suggests a cruciform layout with the vertical line delineated from God the Father down to the monstrance on the altar below. The arms of the cross are suggested by the line of honored saints flanking the Savior. Let us take a closer look at the disputation to comprehend its complete meaning. Two realms are depicted in the fresco, heaven above and earth below. Above all is a stylized version of a velarium, a sort of canopy that was used to shelter people from the harsh sun and elements. This symbol had been used since early Christian days as a sign of heavenly protection of the faithful. It is usually rendered in gold, a pure metal and sign of perfection. The velarium here is filled with shadowy figures of angels and the blessed. In this space, we see God the Father with the globe in his left hand and blessing us with his right. To the left and right of the Father, floating in the clouds, are six angels. Below the Father, Christ sits enthroned and flanked by the Virgin on the left and John the Baptist on the right. Jesus came from the womb of Mary, thus sustaining the humanity of the Savior. John points to Jesus as he was his harbinger. And just below Jesus, is the dove representing the Holy Spirit. The vertical alignment of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reflects the filioque clause of the Nicene Creed. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. It might be noted that some artistic license was taken in the version of this work at Mount Carmel Church, as the dove is above God the Father. Probably the placement of the statuary niche above the altar had something to do with this decision. Seated in a semicircle around the throne of Christ are placed some of the most important personages of the Old and New Testaments, the foundation upon which the church has been built. This configuration recalls a classical symposium in which wise men would exchange ideas. The effect of the curved lineup of luminaries functions much like the curved porticos of St. Peter's Square, welcoming and drawing in the viewer. Vasari writes that the artist depicted these characters 
showing old age in the expressions of the holy patriarchs, simplicity in the apostles, and faith in the martyrs. On the left, the viewer sees St. Peter with the key to the church, Adam, St. John the Evangelist, a young man writing in his gospel, King David with his harp, St. Stephen, and Jeremiah. On the right, the viewer sees Judas Maccabeus, St. Lawrence, Moses with the rays of divine light above his head, St. Matthew, or James, Abraham with the knife with which he was to sacrifice Isaac, and St. Paul with the sword. It is interesting to note that in the Mount Carmel version, a halo has been placed on the second character from the right. That would mean that this person is a saint and not Isaac from the Old Testament. Our best guess then is that in this version we see St. Bartholomew, who was martyred by being flayed with a knife. To the left and right of the Dove of the Holy Spirit fly cherubs who hold up books of the Gospels. The cherub on the right holds the Gospel of John, and he glances upward and to our left towards the saint as he writes in his book. In the Mount Carmel version, these cherubs have switched sides. But the cherub with the Gospel of St. John still manages to look up to his right, our left, to John. It has been said that the upper part of this fresco depicts the church triumphant in heaven, and through the wounds visible on Christ, a reminder of the day of universal judgment. The lower portion of the fresco, which has not been reproduced in Mount Carmel Church, shows the church militant upon earth. Here, thinkers, scholars, and theologians do not just gather for the celebration of the Eucharist, they are engaged in an animated discussion on the mystery of it. Here is the link between the two facing frescoes, a search for truth, reason versus faith. The characters in the lower portion of the fresco are seeking to comprehend the transubstantiation of the body and blood of Christ. The scene is populated with representatives of the church, including four doctors of the church, St. Dominic, Francis, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, Scotus, and Nicholas. Pope Julius II, the patron of Raffaello, and thus an homage to him. Pope Sixtus IV, dressed in gold. Savonarola, the firebrand monk responsible for the bonfire of the vanities. Dante Alighieri, the great Italian poet whose mystical travel through hell purgatory and paradise in his Divina Commedia is the most translated and read book after the Bible, and Bramante. Again, the artist shows his appreciation for the intelligence of his friend as he leans on a railing, gesturing into his book, looking at the man to the right. A disputation does not mean there is a disagreement among the earthly characters of the lower level. It is rather a formal argument that stresses not disagreement, but strives to understand. The animated figures gesture with their hands, make movements with their bodies, bend their ears, knit their brows, and exhibit different facial expressions. And Raffaello knits it all together by repeating gestures from the heavenly realm to that of earth. The uplifted finger of John the Baptist is reflected in the uplifted figure to the right of the altar below. The hands to the chest of the Madonna are reflected in the figure to the left of the altar. Saint Stephen above points to the standing figure with the blue toga below who seems to be making a point. The conversation between Peter and Adam above is reflected diagonally across to the bottom right between the characters at the railing. The obvious difference in the characters above from those below is that those in heaven are serene. They get it. They know the truth. 
the mortals below are still wrestling with the truth. They have yet to completely grasp it.